Hey, hey, Eric here with 30 by 40 Design Workshop. I wanted to talk about how architects use the sun to influence their designs, but rather than speak in generalities, I wanted to use a detail from our project to show you how it works in practice. Before we get into the detail, you'll need a little background. One of the most responsible things you can do as an architect is to listen. And that, for me, always begins with the site, the climate, geography, wind patterns, and of course, the sun. Architecture is nothing without light, and it's perhaps the most important organizing force for our work. It's usually where I start my site analysis, by diagramming the path of the sun as an overlay on the site plan, and I'll get into the specifics on how I do this in a minute. The predominant solar orientation, where the most direct sunlight comes from, here in the Northern Hemisphere, is the south. So the more of our building that can face south, the more efficiently we're able to capture and use the sun for natural light and passive heating, and even cooling, as we'll see in a minute. This approach not only saves energy, reducing lighting, heating, and cooling costs, but it's also better for our own health and well-being. For this project, the lot was sloping and rather long, with a neighboring residence close by to the north. The views to the ocean were all off to the east. With an east-facing site like this, you're faced with a dilemma. Do you orient the long axis of the building north and south to give the client the view of the ocean they requested from every room? Or do you deny the water view in favor of a more sensible solar aspect? Truthfully, I wanted it both ways. The solution I designed divided the program into public and private wings, each oriented with their long axes east and west, as you can see here in the site plan. This gave me the long flank of the building to collect sunlight, and I could still orient some of the most important spaces, the master suite, the living room, and a guest suite toward the water view. The every room has to have a view of the ocean is a common request where I practice. It's one of the main draws of buying a piece of waterfront property, obviously, but I always try to advocate for a deeper exploration of the site and an interweaving of the architecture into the larger whole. This site has many other features to explore in addition to the water view. By using the circulation to stitch the building volumes together, I could continually change the perspective as my client moved throughout their house and their day. Arriving home, they would head east and then south and then east again. And this combined with a changing horizon line and sets of interior steps which mirrored the sloping site, this allowed each space to capture a different perspective on the site. Now let's dig a little deeper on the impacts of the sun on this specific design solution. The plan is laid out as three linear bars, each stepping down with the topography toward the water. Initial approach might be to simply extrude the bar and put a flat roof on it, but this is less dynamic. It doesn't really react to the solar exposure in any specific way. But by picking up the southern eave of the roof like this and adding a glazed Claire story in the void, this became a really efficient device for letting in sunlight on the southern exposure. The higher you can locate a window on a wall, the deeper it will admit daylight into the interior. As we look at the section, you can see another solar advantage of the shed roof. It allows daylight to pass by the roof form and reflect off the taller northerly wing. Because the private wing contained a lot more program than the public wing, five bedrooms, a laundry, a library, and a mudroom area, we had to design it as a two-story volume. The site analysis made it clear that placing it to the northerly edge of the site would confer a number of advantages. It blocked the views to the neighboring residents, it served as a wind block from the harsh northerly winds on the site, and if we made it two stories tall, we could use it to help bounce light back to the northerly face of the living wing, as you can see here. So I'd encourage you to think about a diverse range of uses when it comes to sunlight and how it interacts with your architecture. How can you exploit it understanding that buildings can absorb, block, filter, consume, store, and reflect sunlight? All right, now that you're up to speed on the larger design moves, it's finally time for the details. Claire Story's efficiently daylight interior spaces, as we've said, but along with all that, natural light comes solar radiation too, which can quickly overheat spaces and make them uncomfortable, which is just the opposite of what we're trying to do with our design. And here's where the details matter. To control the light and heat on southern exposures, you'll predominantly want to be considering horizontal elements for screening. That's because the sun moves from a low altitude in the winter 
to a high one in the summer. Horizontal objects act like the brim of a hat to shade the building, and it's the high angle sun that presents the most danger for overheating. While the low angle sun is good for us here in a cold climate, we wanna let in the winter sun and use it to offset our heating costs. Horizontal elements can include an overhang, a sunshade, awnings, screens, louvers, or brusselet. Because our design was so linear, horizontal louvers seemed the most appropriate. Now we could have just matched the coursing on the siding and called it good, but there's more to it than that. The spacing and depth of the horizontal louvers can be tuned to your exact geographic location. Why not, right? This is where the sun charts come in handy. Now a lot of people have been asking about these and I'll quickly show you how they work. There are essentially four dates in the calendar year that you care about when considering the sun's impact on your architecture. The solstices in December and June are the points when the sun is at its extreme arc, either high or low. And then there's the equinoxes in March and September. These are the midway sort of transition points between the two extremes. To design the depth and spacing of the louver blades, you'll wanna know the altitude of the sun at solar noon for each of the four important dates. In this cold climate, we can take advantage of the lower angle of the winter sun for passive solar heating, and our design can keep the higher angle, hotter sunlight out in the summer. Now there's a really fantastic podcast by the Australian architect Amelia Lee called The Undercover Architect, and she does a deep dive on this topic. I think it's something like a six part series, which covers each different exposure and how you might treat it with your architecture, how that impacts design. Now she's got her Norths and Souths all flipped around because well, She's Australian, but seriously, it's really well done. You need to follow her if you're not already. Links are in the description below. Okay, next step is to take these angles and plot these values on your drawing. Remember the angle is above zero degrees, which is for our purposes, the horizon. So naturally 90 degrees would be straight overhead. So here in Maine, it's something a lot less than 90 degrees. Okay, so these are our values for the important calendar dates. And given these angles, I start with some basic assumptions about my louver design. And then I begin tweaking as necessary to get the intended effect. Now you can use SketchUp or Revit, and I really like the app Sunseeker and the real-time augmented reality, especially for renovations. These tools will all help you study and understand sun angles much more quickly and in, perhaps intuitively than sketching it out by hand. But for details like these, I find sketching to be the most tactile and enjoyable way to design. Now here's what we ended up with for our design. And you can see that it balances admitting ample winter sun and blocking out the high angle summer sun. The rest of the year, I tried to balance it out. And there's some bit of magic between the spacing, material efficiencies, and the depth of the louvers. And for that, you'll just have to play around with it to get it right. The more materially efficient you can be, the less expensive the sun shading system will be to construct. Now there are a lot of other ways we could have done this, including addressing it from the inside, but the most efficient way to keep the overheating and glare issues from becoming a problem inside is to keep the sun from striking the glass in the first place. And that means an external solution. Now the last thing I'll mention about the solar design here is that passively heating spaces this way, it allows you to take advantage of the stack effect too if you add operable windows up high as we did in our Claire story. As the interior air heats up and rises and we open the upper windows, it sets up a natural convective flow, exhausting warmer stale air up high and admitting cooler, fresh air down low. All the resources I used and mentioned in this video are in the description below. I hope this helped explain some of the design opportunities the sun can provide. The data contained in solar charts are immensely useful and pretty easy to divine when you know what you're looking for. Smash that like button below if this has helped you in any way. It tells me you stick around to the end, and I so appreciate that. Be sure to follow me on Instagram for drawings, sketches, and studio process images if you're not already. Cheers, my friends. We'll see you again next time.